Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture video for Unit 5. Um, today we're going to talk about fisheries and fishing and how we get another major source of food and protein, except not from land but from the ocean. How we harvest them, how our practices are impacting the oceans and the communities in living in the oceans, and what are the alternatives to make sure that we're protecting them and, and using these resources sustainably. So a fishery is a term used to describe any uh, uh, population of fish that we harvest at a commercial level uh, in a particular area, right? So there are fisheries all around the world. Um, in Asia and Africa, almost all of the animal protein that they're getting is coming from fish, and uh, we are seeing a rapid increase in um, the, the farming of fisheries as opposed to going out and catching from fisheries. Uh, and we're seeing a decrease in the amount of fish being caught in the uh, wild fisheries around the world's oceans. So we're seeing some interesting patterns that we'll break down as we get through, um, but generally speaking with in terms of fisheries, uh, at least in the United States in 2018, uh, we made over, oh geez, over 11 billion dollars off of fisheries, most of that being for food, 92 percent of it being for edible products, uh, and 8 percent used for industrial products like bait and cat food and uh, you know, oil, things like that, fish oil pills. Um, and uh, we process a lot of different species in the United States. The biggest one is the Alaskan Pollock, um, both in terms of weight and in terms of the amount of money, but also shrimp, sockeye, salmon, tuna, and cod are major sources uh, for fish, for, or, or major resources that we pull from fisheries in the U.S. But fisheries aren't just in the U.S., they're all around the globe, like I mentioned. Um, much of the animal protein in Asia and Africa is from fisheries. And if you look at all these different fisheries along the coastlines of different continents, you can see that the warmer the color, the more intense the fishing in that region. And that tracks with what I was saying earlier about certain areas of the world having very high fishing. Uh, there's also very high fishing in New England, particularly in, in Massachusetts and Cape Cod. Um, and, and as we look at these fisheries, you might notice, well, why isn't the middle of the ocean, uh, why isn't that colored? Why doesn't it tell us about the fishing effort there? Uh, and that's because when we think about who has rights to the fish in the ocean, it only extends so far as the borders of that country, right? Because beyond that, nobody really owns the rights to the fish in the ocean. It's not like forests where it's clearly within your territory as a country. Um, and because of that, there is no one to regulate necessarily global fishing practices and global fishing um, patterns. And there's less incentive for one country to use sustainably and try and replenish these fish stocks. And that's something we've talked about multiple times now called the tragedy of, this co of the commons. There's a shared resource, and if one or more individuals is using that resource in an unfair way, unsustainable way, it's going to uh, ruin that resource for everybody else. And that, in, the, in terms of fishing, leads to a process called overfishing, which is exactly what it sounds like. We're fishing too much uh, to the point where we're starting to see fisheries collapse around the globe. And a fishery collapse is defined as when the population drops by 90% of more, and about a third, almost a third of the world's fisheries have collapsed as of right now. Uh, that's a pretty substantial um, pretty substantial loss. And if you take a look at this graph, we've got time running on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we've got the percentage of fish stocks that were underexploited in blue, fully exploited in this sand color, overexploited in orange, and crashed in orange, uh, dark red or whatever. So you can see that the number of fisheries that are being sustainably harvested has gone down, whereas the number of fisheries that are being exploited and eventually crashing is increasing. So uh, this is a pretty substantial pattern that we're seeing in terms of uh, the tragedy of commons playing out in real time. Now, we are overfishing our oceans. And that is, can be pretty bad uh, for, from a human impact, right? There are many communities that are subsistent, subs, subsistence fishers, uh, meaning that they rely on the fish that they catch in order to eat and make money. Um, and fishing also plays a huge role in the economy, right? Billions of dollars every year in, in the United States alone. Uh, so overfishing in the long run is going to have detrimental impacts on both of these things. Uh, you might be wondering how fish are harvested. Uh, it's not like you see on the TV or in the movies. Um, it, they can be harvested through trawling, which is when a, a boat basically carries a, a wide a big net behind it to catch any fish in it. Uh, long line fishing is when you set up a giant line full of hooks 
and you just kind of string it out for miles and you pull it in every so often and see what fish you get. Uh, seine nets are usually done from the shoreline. Uh, you've got a long net and you can kind of wrap it around fish and walk towards the shore and pull them on the land. I did that once and accidentally caught an alligator, so that's fun. Um, and uh, drift nets, or sometimes called gill nets, uh, you can set them up in the water, stake them into the ground, put some anchors and some buoys up, and fish will try to swim through, and their gills will get caught in it, and they will um, they will die. And then you pull the net in, and you capture the fish. Uh, you might notice, though, all of these practices are non-discriminatory, meaning that this net isn't going to distinguish between a turtle or a dolphin versus a tuna or a salmon or something like that. Um, so that can create some problems. Uh, thankfully, these large-scale gill nets or drift nets have been banned by the UN because they lead to some pretty substantial uh, pollution and uh, eventual loss of biodiversity by strangling and killing organisms. Uh, there's also purse seine nets, which can be put out in the ocean, and you, you kind of uh, make a circle with them, and then you draw them shut like a, um, like a purse string or a drawstring on a bag, and you trap all the fish that are inside it. Uh, and some fisher people will actually use spotter planes uh, or sonar to try and track groups of fish that are traveling through the ocean and it allows these ships to track down schools of fish at very very rapid paces and follow them, see where they go, look at their patterns, migration patterns, etc. So uh, fishing has improved substantially because of technology. But there's a lot of environmental damages that result from this. Uh, trawling particularly can destroy seafloor habitat, uh, any sort of Plants like uh, seagrasses or animals or uh, you know foundation species like coral reefs uh, will, can be destroyed if the net you know is is pretty heavy. It's weighted down. It can rip them out of the ground. Um, their recent study has been showing that it can uh, uh, dis or, or uh, offset or or dis disbalance unbalance the nutrients in the seafloor and the uh, the habitat in the seafloor as well as the microbe communities in the seafloor. Uh, additionally, like I mentioned, these nets are not discriminatory. You might be trying to catch crabs, but you might also catch some rays or some sea turtles or some dolphins. Uh, and this can reduce biodiversity, it can threaten endangered species, and it's also it's just extremely sad, I think. Um, and there are a lot of uh, large mammals that live in the ocean that are being driven to extinction because of these fishing practices. Uh, thankfully, we've we've made some adjustments to the way we fish um, with some of these nets. A turtle exclusion device or these metal bars that are located in a net. So a fish will go through these metal bars and get caught in the net. A turtle will hit those metal bars and kind of slide out out of this opening on the side. So it prevents sea turtles from being caught. I don't think there's anything like that for dolphins, however. Uh, here's another picture showing the same thing. So the shrimp get caught, the turtles get excluded because they can't fit through the grate that's right there. So they slide out. So that's a, a one approach to fixing the bycatch problem, but it's still dragging this net across the bottom of the water and destroying the benthic habitat. And additionally, these nets are a huge source of pollution. About 46% of plastic waste that's in the ocean, uh, particularly in the garbage patch, is actually nets. So yes, stop buying plastic straws, you don't need them, but a huge component is actually discarded nets from fishers. Um, uh, thankfully, there are some alternatives to fishing in the wild fisheries uh, to help be more sustainable, and uh, we can do that through something called aquaculture, which is basically like farming fish. We breed them, we raise them, we harvest them in uh, controlled environments, and we can do that not only with fish, but also shellfish like mussels and clams, plants uh, like kelp, and algae as well. And there are two, two main methods to doing this. One is fish farming, which are man-made ponds. This is often done for carp or uh, shrimp. And you've got the man-made ponds. Sometimes they are done within a larger pond like this, or sometimes they are, they are dug out and filled with water. Um, or uh, and it's done with a lot of a variety of different species. Uh, or alternatively, you can actually set up pens inside a, a larger body of water and open enclosures and this is also done with a wide variety of organisms. Um, this has a lot of benefits. One, it's much more efficient because all the fish are in one place. It's literally, well, not quite literally, but pretty close to literally shooting fish in a barrel. Uh, you need less area of water, less fuel needed from these boats because they don't have to travel as far searching for schools of fish. They know exactly where to go. You know, boats 
Traveling boats is, is the number one source of fossil fuel emissions from the fishing, in, fishing industry. There are a lot of drawbacks, though. First of all, uh, these large amounts of fish in small regions, you look at this water, it does not look clean, and it is not. All of these fish are defecating, and that starts to build up and become highly concentrated, and it can pollute the surrounding water. Um, the escaped fish can, if they are genetically engineered or if they are non-native species, they can breed with wild fish. They can reduce the genetic species or genetic diversity in the habitat. Um, and uh, the fish are kept at such high densities as you see here. We know that disease is density dependent. The more organisms in a space, the more likelihood that disease can develop and spread very rapidly. This is an example of sea lice, which is a, a parasite very uh, common among fish and uh, particularly salmon. And lastly, the feed. Uh, you need to feed these fish and that food needs to come from somewhere. Uh, so that's another source of uh, uh, resources that need to be used. Uh, recently, there have been lots of uh, developments in genetic uh, engineering and, and artificial selection in fish. If you think about cows, cows have been domesticated for 10,000 years. It's easy to breed cows because they live on land. You can put them in a pen. It's harder to do that with fish. Uh, so only more recently have we started genetically engineering fish to get some really, really fantastic results, like um, increase of like 10 to 15 percent in size with per generation, which is insane. Um, so increased yields, faster growing, resistant to disease. You can make your salmon more pink if that's something that's appealing to you. Uh, some, some farms are actually working on making fish that are bone free. Uh, so some really interesting developments happening there. And aquaculture is on the rise. If we take a look at this graph, on the x-axis we've got time, and on the y-axis we've got tons in millions. Uh, fisheries, uh, marine fi fisheries, so saltwater fisheries are this light orange color. You can see they've been rising and then they've kind of plateaued in the past 20 years or so. Whereas aquacultures, uh, both marine and inland, are these darker blue colors here. Those are rising substantially. So we're getting more and more of our seafood from aquaculture, which is great because it is certainly more sustainable than fishing out in, in wild capture fisheries. Uh, same graph you can see here, just, just zooming in. Wild captures in blue, aquacultures in green. Aquaculture is getting more popular. And if we look around the world, most of the aquaculture is happening in Asia, almost all of it. Uh, but these, these wedges are growing. A lot of that has to do with the fact that um, Asia is a much larger continent, more people, more dependent on fish than a place like North America. There are more sustainable approaches even to fish farming, however, um, that will help reduce some of the negative environmental side effects of fish farms. So first of all, you can have fish farms on land in tanks that are built in warehouses. And these are really great. Uh, low environmental impacts, really the only impacts is that you need energy to, to power these tanks and to light the facilities, and keep them heated and stuff like that. Um, you can control the conditions for the fish pretty intensely, lower disease, you can change the temperature, you know, think about all the abiotic factors that fish are um, dependent on. You can alter those as needed, salinity, pH, you name it. Uh, the water can be filtered and recycled, so there's not really a lot of water waste here, um, but it does need more electricity, like I mentioned, which usually comes from fossil fuel combustion. But you can build them anywhere, and they don't take up nearly as much space as a, f a normal fish farm that is built, like, on the coast. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's another diagram from the Mon Monterey Bay Aquarium showing what uh, land-based circ recirculation tanks can look like. Uh, and the, the second more sustainable option is, uh, this is one of my favorite things in the whole course, it's so cool, integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, which is basically this idea that we've got a fish farm that's out in the open water, um, but instead of just farming one type of fish, we're farming a, multiple different species, trying to recreate an ecosystem in a controlled environment, so that way uh, each species is playing a different role to help mitigate some of the n negative side effects. Uh, so for example, um, you might have uh, a fish that eats a kelp, and that kelp uh, introduces energy into the ecosystem via photosynthesis, but you're also growing lobsters, which are help decompose any of the waste or the dead organisms. So it's kind of a circular system that tries to mimic natural processes. I'll show you a video on this in class. It's, it's a, a really fantastic, and what it also means is that the, the farmer or the fisher person is now has, instead of just one crop of fish, they have fish, they might have mussels and lobsters and kelp as well, so they've got multiple different products that they can sell. Um, but when we think about uh, fish, whether it's fish farms, whether it's uh, wild uh, uh, fisheries that, we're, that we are going out and harvesting, uh, 
we, it's, I'm going to circle back to the tragedy of the commons, uh, this idea that if, you know, if one nation is taking too much, it's not going to leave enough for the rest. Uh, and so what we need to do to, to amend the tragedy of the commons and prevent that from happening is put rules and regulations in place so that way uh, there are limits on how much you can take and where you can take it from. And one of the ways to do that are with marine protected areas or MPAs. And these can vary in terms of whether you can, you can take some fish but only so many, or maybe you can't take any fish at all, or maybe you can't even enter this area of the ocean at all because they want to limit pollution. So there, there are all different types of NPAs around the world. Some of them are just during certain times of year, some of them are year round, uh, but only uh, about less than 2% less than of, of the world's uh, surface area is uh, totally protected. Uh, so it's not a lot of ocean that is being protected, um, but it, it, they have been shown to be extraordinarily impactful. So, uh, One interesting case study, and then uh, we're all set, is the Cassius Ledge, which is off the, Gulf, off, off the Gulf of Maine. And this is a hot spot of biodiversity. It's the largest kelp forest on the east coast of the United States. It provides nursery grounds for a variety of fish and uh, mollusk species, extremely high primary productivity, but it's it's also extremely sensible to global warming and warming ocean temperatures. Uh, so there's limited fishing there already, uh, but they're trying to push to make it a national monument. Uh, my professor from college and, and one of my friends, his grad student, have been, have been pushing this uh, effort for a while. Unfortunately, I think it, it got rejected recently. Um, I'll have to double check on that. I haven't looked into it in a while. Um, but it's a, it's a really great case study of why it's important to protect uh, the fisheries, and all the ecosystem services that they provide and, and ways to do that uh, through legislation. Um, one of the reasons that it might have gotten knocked down is because the local fishing community was pushing back saying, hey, you know, this is, uh, this is our livelihood. You know, it's important that we are able to fish here so that way we can support ourselves and our families. And that's totally valid. And that's one of the uh, difficulties that arises when trying to, you know, uh, build a compromise. It's not easy. Um, so what can you do? Watch what you eat. Avoid eating certain uh, types of fish that are worse than others. You can get this app from Monterey Bay Aquarium on your phone called the Seafood Watch app. Um, you can look up restaurants or stores or types of fish and see if they are sustainably sourced. Um, and these are the types of fish that we, we can feel good about eating. Um, so uh, keep your eye on that when you go out to eat. Or, you know, maybe lower eating meat. Perhaps, maybe. Uh, anyway, um, that's all I've got for you today. If you've got questions about fishing or fish farming, bring them to class. Otherwise, I will see you then.